reduce the federal deficit by $160 billion. Hear me? $160 billion, you know? And we've cut deficit by over, by the time it's out, over $2 trillion. We've cut the deficit. And while I'm paying for it, we're also reducing the federal debt at the same time. You know, the Republicans talk about, you know, big tax and Democrats. Give me a break. Come on. We've, I've already cut the federal deficit by $1 trillion since I took office. My Republican friends tell me we're spending a lot of money. It's saving billions of dollars. It's saving billions of dollars. We're actually cutting the deficit, too. With Maggie and your delegation's help, I've already cut the federal deficit by $1 trillion. It's wild how comfortable these people are lying. It's, it's crazy. It's, it's like that something goes wrong with your soul when you're, when you're there. Republicans do this, too. They're all over the news today, too, telling you how great this whole thing is. Joining me now, great senator from the state of Kentucky, Senator Rand Paul, one of the few people actually trying to stop all this craziness, as he often does. Also, you should go by that book he wrote, Deception. That's pretty uh, apropos for where we are. Senator, I... Do these people genuinely not understand the fiscal collapse that's coming? It's coming. Everyone knows it. It's math. Do they not know? You know, I think math is not the strong suit of our president. He has a little bit of trouble with the English language, but definitely trouble with math. He seems to interchange deficit and debt a lot. And so at one point in that clip you showed, he says he's reducing the debt, which is an absolute falsehood. The debt is growing exponentially. We're up to over 34 trillion in debt and it's climbing every day. Yeah, yeah, in the next year, the spending proposals that the Democrats are gonna vote for and probably 10 or 15 Republicans will join them to pass, uh, as well as the majority in the House have voted for this now, will add to the debt uh, 1.5 trillion. Now the little trickery that's being performed here is, and sleight of hand is, that the debt did get enormously bad. The worst records were under COVID when they shut the entire economy down, the lockdowns that I opposed, they passed out checks to everyone. The deficit in one year actually exceeded 3 trillion. So the record was set during the COVID lockdowns, oh. but it's disingenuous to say, oh, they're not quite as bad as they were under the, the worst deficits ever uh, to mean that there's not any deficits. The deficits over a trillion dollars a year is alarming. The Federal Reserve chairman warned about this. Jamie Dimon from J.P. Morgan Chase warned about this. There are many authors warning that the debt is unsustainable, and that's why I'm fighting against these bills, loaded with earmarks, loaded with waste, and really loaded with deficit spending. How gross is this bill, Senator? I know, of course, they dropped it in the dead of night, as they always do. And it, look, it's $1.2 trillion. That number alone is disgusting. But what all is in this disaster? But we haven't yet categorized it all yet. We have the one from last week that we passed on. We now know what was in we, what we passed last week. Had 6,000 earmarks and $12 billion worth of earmarks. I don't yet have a total on this, this week's earmarks or things, but we're going through it page by page. We'll be lucky if we get a first read through before the uh, final vote on this. The final vote will probably happen tomorrow. And people have to realize Republicans have absolutely abdicated the power of the purse. We have a majority in the House, and we have a filibuster-proof minority in the Senate. What does that mean? It takes 60 votes to pass this spending bill. If all Republicans held together, it wouldn't pass, and we would have the leverage to actually reduce spending. Instead, we have collaborators, fellow travelers, who will work with the Democrats, and they will pass this bloated spending bill. But unfortunately, Speaker Johnson has gone along with them in, in, the, in the House. So really, the power of the purse has been abdicated. When I go home, people are like, we elected you Republicans. We elected Republicans as a majority in the House, and you're not using your power. They're absolutely right. Republicans in the House who voted for the spending bill and the Republicans in the Senate who vote with the Democrats for this bill have abdicated the power of the purse, and they're not doing what they were elected to do. And I hope people at home will be very unhappy with them and maybe bring some of them back into the private sector and send up replacements. Yeah, I, I think you're right. Senator, I'll be honest with you. And he, I've had him on the show before. His voting record actually isn't all that bad. I'm so incredibly disappointed in Speaker Johnson. It's not that I expected him to move mountains with a tiny majority, but what have we accomplished at all? Anything? Well, here's what should have happened or what could happen. He can't win everything. I acknowledge that, but he has the majority in the yeah. House. And then he also has, uh, we have a filibuster-proof minority in the Senate. If the Senate leadership 
and Mike Johnson got together and went to Schumer and said, well, you're wanting to spend $6 trillion, and we want to spend $5 trillion, so why don't we split the difference and spend $5.5 trillion? That's not happening. What happens is all of the spending is on autopilot. The entitlement spending is going up 5 to 6%. They're all afraid to look at entitlements. Then the military is going up 3%. They're not willing to look at that. So really, they're only looking at 16% of the budget, the non-military discretionary, and they're just whittling tiny little bits away from that. But they've made the mistake, and many people in Washington make this mistake, is when you take entitlements off the table, that's two-thirds of the spending. So two-thirds of government's on autopilot. just goes on and on and on, and nobody's doing anything about two-thirds of the spending. So if you ignore two-thirds of the spending, the deficit can never be addressed. The budget that we vote okay. for is military and non-military discretionary. That's about... 1.5 trillion that's equal to the deficit the entire budget i vote on is being borrowed okay so how do we address these entitlements i i know it's the political third rail i know the second you bring up the word social security you might as well start packing up your office because you're getting ready to get kicked out of office i understand all that at the same time it is going to collapse the country so do we right. just wait until that do, do we wait five years until it's out and then then and then we deal with it I think being honest on entitlements isn't the third rail of politics. I ran in 2009 for the first time and I told people that the age of Social Security must be raised. I've told people that we probably are going to have to have higher deductibles for Medicare. I've told people that all of these things are going bankrupt and it's not that I want to have reforms, it's that if we don't have the reforms, there will be no Social Security for the next generation and there will be no Medicare. And it's going to happen pretty quickly. Within the next couple of years, the people who live on the, the basic uh, smallest amount of Social Security, which I believe is around $700 a month, those people will get a 20% cut in their Social Security unless we reform it. So you have to reform it. In fact, I think the people that are disingenuous on this are the AARP who sends out letters saying, tell Rand Paul to get his hands off my Social Security. Well, you know, if we do nothing to Social Security like AARP wants, it will fail and it will utterly fail the poorest among us and hurt them the worst. So, you know, I think the entitlements are not a third rail. Honest with people, people are willing to be honest. If you tell them the age has to go up because we're living longer, they haven't voted me out because I've said that. I've introduced bills that would actually raise the age of Social Security gradually, a couple of months a year. And what happens is it's not as noticeable to people. Like right now, the people going uh, retiring would have to wait three months. And next year, the, the people retiring would have to wait four months. And next year, they'd have to wait five months. And over about a 20-year period, you raise the age to probably about 70. We already did this once. In 1983, we raised the age from 65 to 67 for Social Security. We need to do it again for Social Security, very gradually raise it to 70, or actually attach it to longevity. And so I've sort of jokingly said, if you live to be 120, you'll get your Social Security at 115. But it's the only way it pays for itself in order to stay afloat. Most European countries do this. You know, Bernie Sanders says he loves the socialism of Sweden. Sweden's age is 70 and going up based on their longevity. Sweden takes their entitlements and actually only allots as much as they're going to spend that year, and then they readdress their entitlements the next year. They actually look at entitlement spending every year as part of their budgetary process. That's what we need to do. Sweden balances their annual budget. Bernie thinks they're a socialist nation, but they actually balance their budget. Now, they do it differently than I would do it. They do it with very high taxes. What I would do it is with lowered spending. I would do it with a smaller government because then the engine of capitalism roars when you lower the spending and have less taxation, you have an enormous economy. And we've got some of that from the tax cut of 2017, but we'd get even more if we would actually restrain spending. Senator, real quick, just to wrap things up here. This TikTok bill, look, I'm just not trustful. I don't like TikTok. I don't have TikTok. My kids don't have TikToks. I, I just don't understand why this Congress could pass a good bill. I, don't, or I should say I don't think this Congress is capable of passing anything good and decent. But you're in the Senate. I'm not. What say you? You know, I don't really like Facebook either. I don't use YouTube. And the reason I don't use YouTube is because they censor me. I don't agree with their politics. So I use Rumble. And so when you don't like something, you don't use it. If you don't think your kids should be on it, don't use it. But here's the interesting thing. They've written a bill that gives the president the authority to shut down anybody they think has foreign influence or foreign influences controlling their uh, company. 
Well, right now, as we sit, Apple has uh, a lot of business in China. Everybody that has an Apple phone in China, the data, because the Chinese government demands it, has to be on Chinese servers that are owned by the government within the country of China. So does that mean Apple is under the uh, control of a foreign country, a foreign adversary like China? And I'm not advocating this, but I'm worried that the bill would actually allow the government to force the sale of Apple as well. They're also telling Apple that they can't put this on the App Store, which I think is going to be a First Amendment uh, problem because the App Store now is full of things where you express yourself. And if the government says that you can't have a, an app on your phone that allows you to put your dance videos up, is that a First Amendment violation? Not only of the people putting up dance videos, 170 million Americans, but it also may be a First Amendment abridgment to the App Store of Apple forbidding them from having different uh, speech applications on their in their app store. We know that this has been tried three times so far, and the federal courts have looked at bans of TikTok three times, and they've been found unconstitutional on First Amendment rights. But the other thing that's important to know is people aren't being honest about this. On Fox News, they're saying, oh, it's owned by the communist government. Well, that's provably false. TikTok is owned by 60% international investors, 20% the two Chinese guys that are software engineers that created the app, and 20% by their employees, which are 7,000 of those employees are Americans. We also know they hold their data on the Oracle Cloud, and they've agreed to have Oracle review any kind of uh, data problems or accusations. The TikTok board is three out of five Americans. So there's a Fifth Amendment problem here. If I wanted to come and take uh, your broadcasting or whoever broadcasts your signal or how you get your word out, if I wanted to take that from you, I can't take that. I can accuse you of being a communist spy, but I can't take it unless I go to court and prove that you are. That's what the Fifth Amendment is about. It's about due process. The government can't take your property. So TikTok is property, and some of that property is owned by Americans. So all these people making accusations, you know, they just have to prove that in court if you want to take someone's property away from them. You have to put them in jail, and you have to prove it in court. If you don't do that and you let the government make these decisions, my goodness, you think they're going to let you or I speak if the government gets a choice to shut us down? Yeah. Already we have YouTube shutting me down. And so it's like, I don't know, I worry about having the government more ability to censor speech.